In Buddhism, a bodhisattva is any person who is on the path towards Buddhahood. In the early Buddhist schools as well as modern Theravada Buddhism, a bodhisattva refers to anyone who has made a resolution to become a Buddha and has also received a confirmation or prediction from a living Buddha that this will be so. In Mahayana Buddhism, a bodhisattva refers to anyone who has generated bodhicitta, a spontaneous wish and compassionate mind to attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. The elaborate concept refers to a sentient being or sattva that develops body or enlightenment, thus possessing the bodhisattva's psyche described as those who work to develop and exemplify the loving-kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity. These four virtues are the four divine abodes, called Brahma-vihara. Chapter 1, Early Buddhism and the Nikaya Schools In early Buddhism, the term Bodhisattva is used in the early texts to refer to Gautama Buddha in his previous lives and as a young man in his current life in the period during which he was working towards his own liberation. During his discourses, to recount his experiences as a young aspirant he regularly uses the phrase when I was an unenlightened Bodhisattva. The term therefore connotes a being who is bound for enlightenment, in other words, a person whose aim is to become fully enlightened. In the Pali Canon, the Bodhisattva is also described as someone who is still subject to birth, illness, death, sorrow, defilement, and delusion. Some of the previous lives of the Buddha as a Bodhisattva are featured in the Jataka tales. According to the Theravada monk Bhikkhu Bodhi, the Bodhisattva path is not taught in the earliest strata of Buddhist texts such as the Pali Nikayas which instead focus on the ideal of the Arahant. The oldest known story about how Gautama Buddha becomes a Bodhisattva is the story of his encounter with the previous Buddha, Dipankara. During this encounter, a previous incarnation of Gautama, variously named Samadha, Megha, or Samati offers five blue lotuses and spreads out his hair or entire body for Dipankara to walk on resolving to one day become a Buddha. Dipankara then confirms that they will attain Buddhahood. Early Buddhist authors saw this story as indicating that the making of a resolution in the presence of a living Buddha, and his prediction slash confirmation of one's future Buddhahood was necessary to become a Bodhisattva. According to Druze, all known models of the path to Buddhahood developed from this basic understanding. The path is explained differently by the various Nikaya schools. In the Theravada Buddha Vamsa, after receiving the prediction, Gautama took four Asamkayas and a hundred thousand, shorter kalpas to reach Buddhahood. The Sarvastivada school had similar models about how the Buddha Gautama became a Bodhisattva. They held it took him three Asamkayas and ninety-one kalpas to become a Buddha after his resolution in front of a past Buddha. During the first Asamkaya, he is said to have encountered and served 75,000 Buddhas, and 76,000 in the second, after which he received his first prediction of future Buddhahood from Dipankara, meaning that he could no longer fall back from the path to Buddhahood. Thus, the presence of a living Buddha is also necessary for Sarvastivada. The Mahamayabhasa explains that its discussion of the Bodhisattva path is partly meant to stop those who are in fact not Bodhisattvas from giving rise to the self-conceit that they are. The Mahavastu of the Mahasamika Lakota Avadins presents four stages of the Bodhisattva path without giving specific time frames. Natural, one first plants the roots of merit in front of a Buddha to attain Buddhahood. Resolution, one makes their first resolution to attain Buddhahood in the presence of a Buddha. Continuing, one continues to practice until one meets a Buddha who confirms one's future Buddhahood. Irreversible, at this stage, one cannot fall back. Chapter 1 Section 1, Later Theravada The Sri Lankan commentator Dhammapala in his commentary on the Karyapitaka, a text which focuses on the Bodhisattva path, notes that to become a Bodhisattva one must make a valid resolution in front of a living Buddha, which confirms that one is irreversible from the attainment of Buddhahood. The Nidanakatha, as well as the Buddha Vamsa and Karyapitaka commentaries makes this explicit by stating that one cannot use a substitute for the presence of a living Buddha, since only a Buddha has the knowledge for making a reliable prediction. This is the generally accepted view maintained in Orthodox Theravada today. 
The idea is that any resolution to attain Buddhahood may easily be forgotten or abandoned during the eons ahead. The Burmese monk Ledi Sayadaw explains that though it is easy to make vows for future Buddhahood by oneself, it is very difficult to maintain the necessary conduct and views during periods when the Dharma has disappeared from the world. One will easily fall back during such periods and this is why one is not truly a full Bodhisattva until one receives recognition from a living Buddha. Because of this, it was and remains a common practice in Theravada to attempt to establish the necessary conditions to meet the future Buddha Maitreya, and thus receive a prediction from him. Medieval Theravada literature and inscriptions report the aspirations of monks, kings and ministers to meet Maitreya for this purpose. Modern figures such as Anagarika Dharmapala, and Yu Nyu both sought to receive a prediction from a Buddha in the future and believed meritorious actions done for the good of Buddhism would help in their endeavor to become bodhisattvas in the future. Over time, the term came to be applied to other figures besides Gautama Buddha in Theravada lands, possibly due to the influence of Mahayana. The Theravada Abhyagiri tradition of Sri Lanka practiced Mahayana Buddhism, and was very influential until the 12th century. Kings of Sri Lanka were often described as bodhisattvas, starting at least as early as Cyrus Angabodi, who was renowned for his compassion, took vows for the welfare of the citizens, and was regarded as a Mahasatta, an epithet used almost exclusively in Mahayana Buddhism. Many other Sri Lankan kings from the 3rd until the 15th century were also described as bodhisattvas and their royal duties were sometimes clearly associated with the practice of the Ten Paramitas. In some cases, they explicitly claimed to have received predictions of Buddhahood in past lives. Theravadin Bhikkhu and scholar Walpola Rahula stated that the Bodhisattva ideal has traditionally been held to be higher than the state of a Sravaka not only in Mahayana but also in Theravada Buddhism. He also quotes the 10th century king of Sri Lanka, Mahinda IV, who had the words inscribed none but the Bodhisattvas will become kings of a prosperous Lanka, among other examples. But the fact is that both the Theravada and the Mahayana unanimously accepted the Bodhisattva ideal as the highest, although the Theravada holds that anybody can be a Bodhisattva, it does not stipulate or insist that all must be Bodhisattva which is considered not practical. Jeffrey Samuels echoes this perspective, noting that while in Mahayana Buddhism the Bodhisattva path is held to be universal and for everyone, in Theravada it is reserved for and appropriated by certain exceptional people. Paul Williams writes that some modern Theravada meditation masters in Thailand are popularly regarded as bodhisattvas. Chapter 2, In Mahayana Buddhism Chapter 2 Section 1, Early Mahayana Mahayana Buddhism is based principally upon the path of a bodhisattva. This path was seen as nobler than becoming an arhat or a solitary Buddha. According to David Drews, Mahayana Sutras unanimously depict the path beginning with the first arising of the thought of becoming a Buddha, or the initial arising of bodhicitta, typically eons before one first receives a Buddha's prediction, and apply the term bodhisattva from this point. The Astasayas Rika Projnaparamita Sutra, one of the earliest known Mahayana texts, contains a simple and brief definition for the term bodhisattva, which is also the earliest known Mahayana definition. This definition is given as the following, because he has body as his aim, a bodhisattva mahasattva is so called. The Astasahas Rika, also divides the path into three stages. The first stage is that of bodhisattvas who first set out in the vehicle, then there is the irreversible stage, and finally the third bound by one more birth, as in, destined to become a Buddha in the next life. Drews also notes that when Mahayana Sutras present stories of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas first arising of the thought of attaining Buddhahood, they invariably depict it as taking place in the presence of a Buddha, suggesting that they shared with all known Nikaya traditions the understanding that this is a necessary condition for entering the path. In addition, though this key fact is often obscured in scholarship, they apparently never encourage anyone to become a Bodhisattva or present any ritual or other means of doing so. Like Nikaya texts, they also regard the status of new or recent bodhisattvas as largely meaningless. The Astasahasrika, for instance, 
states that as many bodhisattvas as their grains of sand in the Ganges turn back from the pursuit of Buddhahood and that out of innumerable beings who give rise to bodhicitta and progress toward Buddhahood, only one or two will reach the point of becoming irreversible. Drews also adds that early texts like the Astasahas Rika treat bodhisattvas who are beginners or not long set out in the vehicle with scorn, describing them as blind, unintelligent, lazy and weak. Early Mahayana works identify them with those who reject Mahayana, or who abandon Mahayana, and they are seen as likely to become sravakas. Rather than encouraging them to become bodhisattvas, what early Mahayana sutras like the Asta do is to help individuals determine if they have already received a prediction in a past life, or if they are close to this point. The Asta provides a variety of methods, including forms of ritual or divination, methods dealing with dreams and various tests, especially tests based on one's reaction to the hearing of the content, in the Astasahasrika itself. The text states that encountering and accepting its teachings mean one is close to being given a prediction and that if one does not shrink back, cower or despair from the text, but firmly believes it, one is irreversible. Many other Mahayana sutras such as the Exavyavyua and the Shorambhama Samadhi Sutra present textual approaches to determine one's status as an advanced bodhisattva. These mainly consist in one's attitude towards listening to, believing, preaching, proclaiming, copying or memorizing and reciting the sutra. According to Drews, this claim that merely having faith in Mahayana sutras meant that one was an advanced bodhisattva, was a departure from previous Nikaya views about bodhisattvas. It created new groups of Buddhists who accepted each other's bodhisattva status. Some of early depictions of the bodhisattva path in texts such as the Ugraparipraka Sutra describe it as an arduous, difficult monastic path, suited only for the few which is nevertheless the most glorious path one can take. Three kinds of bodhisattvas are mentioned, the forest, city, and monastery bodhisattvas, with forest dwelling being promoted a superior, even necessary path in sutras such as the Ugraparipraka, and the Samadhiraja sutras. The early Rastrapalaparipka sutra also promotes a solitary life of meditation in the forests, far away from the distractions of the householder life. The Rastrapala is also highly critical of monks living in monasteries and in cities who are seen as not practicing meditation and morality. The Ratnagane Zampiyagatha also says the Bodhisattva should undertake ascetic practices, wander freely without a home, practice the paramitas and train under a guru in order to perfect his meditation practice and realization of Prajnaparamita. Some scholars have used these texts to argue for the forest hypothesis, the theory that the initial Bodhisattva ideal was associated with a strict forest asceticism. But other scholars point out that many other Mahayana sutras do not promote this ideal, focusing on sutra-based practices. Some Mahayana sutras promoted another revolutionary doctrinal turn, claiming that the three vehicles of the Sravakayana, Pratikabuddhayana, and the Bodhisattvayana were really just one vehicle. This is most famously promoted in the Lotus Sutra, which claims that the very idea of three separate vehicles is just an apaya a skillful device invented by the Buddha to get beings of various abilities on the path. But ultimately, it will be revealed to them that there is only one vehicle, the Ikayana, which ends in Buddhahood. Chapter 2 Section 2 Mature Mahayana Over time, Mahayana Buddhists developed mature systematized doctrines about the Bodhisattva path. The authors of the various Madhyamaka Shastras often presented the view of the Ikayana. The texts and sutras associated with the Yogacara school developed a different theory of three separate katras or lineages, that inherently predisposed a person to either the vehicle of the Ahat, Pratikabuddha or Samayak Sambuddha. However, the term, was also used in a broader sense. According to the 8th century Mahayana philosopher Haribhadra, the term Bodhisattva can refer to those who follow any of the three vehicles, since all are working towards body. Therefore, the specific term for a Mahayana Bodhisattva is a Mahasattva Bodhisattva. According to Atiza's 11th century Bodhipatha Pradipa, the central defining feature of a Mahayana Bodhisattva is the universal aspiration to end suffering for all sentient beings, which is termed Bodhicitta. 
Later Sanskrit Mahayana Buddhists also developed specific rituals and devotional acts for the arising of this absolutely central quality of bodhicitta, such as the seven-part worship. This ritual form is visible in the works of Shanti Deva and includes Vandana Puja Sarana Gamana Papadizana Panyanyamodana Adhaizana and Yakana Request to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to continue preaching Dharma. Atma Bhavadi Parachyaga. Contemporary Mahayana Buddhism follows this model and encourages everyone to give rise to bodhicitta and ceremonially take bodhisattva vows. With these vows, one makes the promise to work for the complete enlightenment of all sentient beings by practicing the transcendent virtues or paramitas. Chapter 2, Section 3. Bodhisattvas and Nirvana. Related to the different views on the different types of yanas or vehicles is the question of a bodhisattva's relationship to nirvana. In the various Mahayana texts, two theories can be discerned. One view is the idea that a bodhisattva must postpone their awakening until full Buddhahood is attained. This view is promoted in some sutras like the Pankavimsatisahasrika Projnaparamita Sutra. The second theory is the idea that there are two kinds of nirvana, the nirvana of an arhat and a superior type of nirvana called a pratisthita that allows a Buddha to remain engaged in the world. This doctrine developed in Yogacara. As noted by Paul Williams, the idea of a pratisthita nirvana may have taken some time to develop and is not obvious in some of the early Mahayana literature, therefore while earlier sutras may sometimes speak of postponement, Later texts saw no need to postpone the superior a pratisthita nirvana. In this Yogacara model, the Bodhisattva definitely rejects and avoids the liberation of the Sravaka and Pratikabuddha, described in Mahayana literature as either inferior or hina or as ultimately false or illusory. That a Bodhisattva has the option to pursue such a lesser path, but instead chooses the long path towards Buddhahood is one of the five criteria for one to be considered a Bodhisattva. The other four are being human, being a man, making a vow to become a Buddha in the presence of a previous Buddha, and receiving a prophecy from that Buddha. Over time, a more varied analysis of Bodhisattva careers developed focused on one's motivation. This can be seen in the Tibetan Buddhist teaching on three types of motivation for generating bodhicitta. According to Petrur and Poche's 19th century words of my perfect teacher, a bodhisattva might be motivated in one of three ways. They are King like bodhicitta, to aspire to become a Buddha first in order to then help sentient beings. Boatman like bodhicitta, to aspire to become a Buddha at the same time as other sentient beings. Shepherd like bodhicitta, to aspire to become a Buddha only after all other sentient beings have done so. These three are not types of people, but rather types of motivation. According to Petrur and Poche, the third quality of intention is most noble though the mode by which Buddhahood occurs is the first, that is, it is only possible to teach others the path to enlightenment once one has attained enlightenment oneself. The ritualized formulation of the Bodhisattva vow also reflects this order. A Bodhisattva vow ritual text attributed to Nagarjuna, of the 2nd-3rd century CE, states the vow as follows, just as the past Tathagata Arhatsamayaksam Buddhas, when engaging in the behavior of a Bodhisattva, generated the aspiration to unsurpassed complete enlightenment so that all beings be liberated, all beings be freed, all beings be relieved, all beings attain complete nirvana, all beings be placed in omniscient wisdom, in the same way, I whose name is so and so, from this time forward, generate the aspiration to unsurpassed complete enlightenment so that all beings be liberated, all beings be freed, all beings be relieved, all beings attain complete nirvana, all beings be placed in omniscient wisdom. The six perfections that constitute bodhisattva practice should not be confused with the acts of benefiting beings that the bodhisattva vows to accomplish once he or she is a Buddha. The six perfections are a mental transformation and need not benefit anyone. This is seen in the story of Vesantara, an incarnation of Shakyamuni Buddha while he was still a bodhisattva, who commits the ultimate act of generosity by giving away his children to an evil man who mistreats them. 
Vesantara's generous act causes indirect harm, however, the merit from the perfection of his generosity fructifies when he attains complete enlightenment as Shakyamuni Buddha. Chapter 2 Section 4, Bodhisattva Grounds or Levels According to many traditions within Mahayana Buddhism, on the way to becoming a Buddha, a Bodhisattva proceeds through ten, or sometimes fourteen, grounds or pumis. Below is the list of the ten pumis and their descriptions according to the Avatamsaka Sutra, and the Dual Ornament of Liberation, a treatise by Gampopa, an influential teacher of the Tibetan Kagyu school. Before a Bodhisattva arrives at the first ground, he or she first must travel the first two of five paths. The Path of Accumulation The path of preparation the ten grounds of the Bodhisattva then can be grouped into the next three paths. Bhumi 1 The Path of Insight Pumis 2-7 The Path of Meditation Pumis 8-10 The Path of No More Learning The chapter of ten grounds in the Avatamsaka Sutra refers to fifty-two stages. The ten grounds are Great Joy It is said that being close to enlightenment and seeing the benefit for all sentient beings, one achieves great joy, hence the name. In this Bhumi the Bodhisattvas practice all perfections, but especially emphasizing generosity. Stainless, in accomplishing the second Bhumi, the Bodhisattva is free from the stains of immorality, therefore, this Bhumi is named Stainless. The emphasized perfection is moral discipline. Luminous, the light of Dharma is said to radiate for others from the Bodhisattva who accomplishes the third Bhumi. The emphasized perfection is patience. Radiant, this Bhumi it is said to be like a radiating light that fully burns that which opposes enlightenment. The emphasized perfection is vigor. Very difficult to train, bodhisattvas who attain this ground strive to help sentient beings attain maturity, and do not become emotionally involved when such beings respond negatively, both of which are difficult to do. The emphasized perfection is meditative concentration. Obviously transcendent, by depending on the perfection of wisdom, does not abide in either samsara or nirvana, so this state is obviously transcendent. The emphasized perfection is wisdom. Gone afar, particular emphasis is on the perfection of skillful means, to help others. Immovable, the emphasized virtue is aspiration. This immovable bhumi is where one becomes able to choose his place of rebirth. Good discriminating wisdom, the emphasized virtue is the understanding of self and non-self. Cloud of Dharma, the emphasized virtue is the practice of primordial wisdom. After the ten humis, according to Mahayana Buddhism, one attains complete enlightenment and becomes a Buddha. With the 52 stages, the Shorangama Sutra recognizes 57 stages. With the ten grounds, various Vahyana schools recognize three to ten additional grounds, mostly six more grounds with variant descriptions. A Bodhisattva above the seventh ground is called a Mahasattva. Some Bodhisattvas such as Samantapedra, are also said to have already attained Buddhahood. Chapter 2 Section 5, Important Bodhisattvas In the Tibetan tradition, the following Bodhisattvas are known as the Eight Great Bodhisattvas, or Eight Close Sons and are seen as the main Bodhisattvas of Shakyamuni Buddha. Manjusari, Avalokiteshvara, Vahapani, Maitreya, Kashitagarbha, Akasagarbha, Sarvani Varanavaskambin, Samantapedra. Chapter 2 Section 6, School Doctrines Some sutras said a beginner would take three to twenty-two countless eons to become a Buddha. Pure Land Buddhism suggests Buddhists go to the Pure Lands to practice as Bodhisattvas. Chantai, Wyan, Chan and Vahyana schools say they teach ways to attain Buddhahood within one karmic cycle. Various traditions within Buddhism believe in specific Bodhisattvas. Some Bodhisattvas appear across traditions, but due to language barriers may be seen as separate entities. For example, Tibetan Buddhists believe in various forms of Tsenre Sikh, who is Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, Guan Yin in China, Guan Om in Korea, Kwanam in Vietnam, and Kanan in Japan. 
Followers of Tibetan Buddhism consider the Dalai Lamas and the Karma Pars to be an emanation of Tsenre Sikh, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. The place of a Bodhisattva's earthly deeds, such as the achievement of enlightenment or the acts of Dharma, is known as a Bodhimanda, and may be a site of pilgrimage. Many temples and monasteries are famous as Bodhimandas. Perhaps the most famous Bodhimanda of all is the Bodhi tree under which Shakyamuni achieved Buddhahood. In the tradition of Chinese Buddhism, there are four mountains that are regarded as Bodhimandas for Bodhisattvas, with each site having major monasteries and being popular for pilgrimages by both monastics and lay people. These four Bodhimandas are Mount Putwo, Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva of Compassion. Mount Eme, Samantapedra, Bodhisattva of Practice. Mount Wutai, Manjusri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Mount Yowa, Kashitagaba, Bodhisattva of the Great Vow. Chapter 3, Iconography and the Popular Mind. In Buddhist art, a Bodhisattva is often described as a beautiful figure, most often personified as a youthful prince with serene expression and graceful manner. This is probably in accordance to the description of Prince Siddhartha Gautama as a Bodhisattva. The depiction of Bodhisattva in Buddhist art around the world aspires to express the Bodhisattva's quality, loving-kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity. Gender-variant representations of some Bodhisattvas, most notably Avalokiteshvara, has prompted conversation regarding the nature of a Bodhisattva's appearance. Chan Master Sheng Yen has stated that Mahasattvas such as Avalokiteshvara are androgynous, which accounts for their ability to manifest in masculine and feminine forms of various degrees. While Bodhisattvas tend to be depicted as conventionally beautiful, there are instances of their manifestation as wrathful and monstrous beings. A notable example is Guanyin's manifestation as a praetor named Flaming Face. This trope is commonly employed among the wisdom kings, among whom Mahamayuri Vidyayani stands out with a feminine title, and benevolent expression. In some depictions, her mount takes on a wrathful appearance. This variation is also found among images of Vahrapani. Chapter 4, Gallery. Chapter 5, General References.